Good morning. Come on, you visitors out there. If you're, if you're stuck in the foyer right now, if you were here for the early service, you've you got to come in for the second service too. So, well, they're not even paying attention to me out there. Oh, whatever. A couple of announcements before we begin. I want to uh, let folks know about Fruitland's Groundhog Feed. It is, uh, again, like they did last year, uh, go and pick it up and take it home so they're not going to have the meal uh, that they normally have, but the sausage is available and it's delicious as usual. So uh, if you're interested in supporting them, the information about that is on the bulletin boards and you can, uh, you can read that. And it'll actually be in the bridge this week because we did get our toner after two months. Yes. Stacy emailed me a picture of it. She was like, yay. It's like, so yeah, it's amazing what little things will make you happy whenever you're, you know, but they were, uh, they were apologetic about the fact that the supply chains and all that. But anyway, so we have the toner, so we're back on track, getting out our publications, doing everything that we need to do as far as printing goes. So uh, hopefully you'll be seeing that this coming week, uh, which is an answer to prayer. Um, I want to let folks know about uh, Pastor Ed Kirchensteiner's memorial service. Uh, he... Uh, meant an awful lot to a lot of people, and so there, they, you may want to have an opportunity to uh, celebrate his life in person. The service will be at Cloverdale uh, Cemetery. They have a chapel there that, uh, that Ed and, and Lou, they did all their pre-planning, and so it was all part of the deal, and so they're going to have it at the chapel at Cloverdale at 1 o'clock on Wednesday the 26th. So this Wednesday, coming Wednesday, 1 o'clock at Cloverdale, if you'd like to come and celebrate his life there. Um, the family's extended an invitation, but they're also letting folks know that they're, they are going to live stream the, uh, the service, and there is a link that we can get you if you're interested in watching that from home. So that is an option as well if you're interested in that. So I wanted to let folks know that that was coming up this week uh, at, uh, on Wednesday. It's that service. Do pray for the Kirchensteiners. Uh, uh, Jim and I were able to meet with them a little bit this last week, and they're tender. You know, and, and it's to be expected. I'm not surprised at it at all. Um, but this is definitely a life worth celebrating. 72 years, was it, of ministry? Think about that. 72 years of ministry. He started at 17 in high school and then said, oh, I got to get some, gotta get, I'm going to give away all the information here. You, you, you might hear it again on, if you come on Wednesday but he, he started, uh, he re responded to a call from his pastor right out of high school, right in high school, and started preaching right away, went and got education, preached while and, and served while he was getting his education, and then just all the way through, just faithful, faithful, faithful. I, the, there was a church that he served that wanted him to go by the title reverend. This was back east somewhere, because that's not what we stand on out here. But they wanted him to go by the title of reverend, and he, was, he, he accepted that. Did not like to be called preacher. Just that's not how he viewed himself. Ed was a pastor. He loved his flock, and he took care of them and was faithful in his servant. And just this, ah, well done. So that's coming up this week. I want to let you folks know about it and do be praying for the Kirchensteiner family. So those are my announcements. Jim, could you begin our service? Seventy-two years. I'm not even close to that age, so it's kind of hard to fathom, you know, a lifetime. And I think that's, you know, that's the thing when we think about Ed and his, he had a lifetime of ministry and we won't uh, share all the little nuggets. So we hope that you can come on, on Wednesday so that we can celebrate um, a life well done. So welcome this morning again. We're glad you all are here. We know our numbers are a little, a little slim today, but you know, we're just glad each one of you are here uh, to share and to worship this morning. I'll read the scripture and then share a few thoughts uh, with you today. Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 6, 7 through 15. And before I do that, let's open with a word of prayer. 
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this, uh, this time that we can come together today to be in your house, to worship with other believers, to quiet our hearts so that we may learn more about you, get closer to you, Lord, just to be a part of the, the bigger church, which is all the believers across the world. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity today. Be with us. Open our hearts and our minds to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Familiar passage of Matthew. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need for before you even ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And this is the one that gets a little hard. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I'm glad that Pastor John's going to do some unpacking on forgiveness uh, today. And it's a, it's a very important topic. Um, just to share a, a, a couple minutes, uh, at my job, my, my door's always open, and I have um, nurses come in sometimes of something that's been difficult or talk to me or want to share. And uh, I had this one particular nurse, probably over the last six months, has been sharing about some family things that she's had going on, and her mother passed, and uh, an older sister, it's a sibling thing going on, and very... Um, um, Lots of dynamics there with the sibling. And so she was sharing uh, these things with me about that. And um, the nurse was just very, very angry. And, you know, we started talking about forgiveness. And every once in a while she'd pop into the office and I'd say, well, how are things going? And she says, I'm just not sure I can ever forgive her. Uh, well, with the grace of God, we're able to kind of explore that a little bit and about what forgiveness really is. And I know John's going to share more about this, but one of the things that I think became very important for her was the forgiveness was not just about telling her sister that she forgave her and, you know, okay, whatever, and all kumbaya and everything's great again, right? But what I tried to, you know, kind of explore with her was that forgiveness is, is a lot to do with how that affects us. And when we forgive somebody, we can kind of get that poison out. We can release it. We can let it go to God. She's a believer, and so I was able to talk to her a little bit about some things there about, you know, forgiveness. And, you know, God forgives us. And she came to me just about a week ago, and she said... And I, I give glory to God. I'm not doing this to say anything about me. But she says, I was, what you said about forgiveness has really made a difference. I met with my sister and we have reconciled. So praise the Lord. Forgiveness is not just about releasing somebody else, but it releases us from a bondage sometimes that people hold on us. And we have some singing to do. You threw me off, Jim. <laughs> I usually try to sneak up here during the prayer time. <laughs> you had prayer first. <laughs> so, well, good morning. So, let's stand and sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Mm -hmm. 
Peggy picked a song that just kind of hit me here, uh, Heartaches and Broken Pieces. There was a lot going on for me the last month, and that's how I feel a little bit, heartaches and broken pieces in my life. With getting COVID, and I lost an uncle, and there was just lots of things and still are going on. Um, but during that time, I realized that even when I couldn't, or just, I don't know what the right word is, feel like I could do things, I think now of the poem of Footprints in the Sand that God carried me through. I'm so thankful, thankful for our church family and, and Amber and family that, that helped through a lot of this process. But I think as we come together in this time of offering, we give not because we have to, because we're thankful and we have gratitude for all that God does for us. I didn't get a bulletin this morning, so I'm guessing it's kids' story next, right? <laughs> okay, kids, come on up. Am I okay? Thanks, Grayson. Oh, it might be. You can come up too, Brittany. Because I, I have, I have, you know, a treat. I have Dave's insanity hot sauce. I knew it was yes, hot. it is the hottest sauce in the universe. Do you think that's a pretty bold claim, isn't it? Let me see. Yeah, you take a look at it if you want. You guys like hot sauce? No. No. No way. It, well, let me tell you, the regular hot sauce is nothing like Dave's Insanity hot sauce. It tastes like ketchup compared to the Dave's Insanity hot sauce. Yep. Yeah. So, here. You want to try some? No. No? Do you, do you guys want to try some? No. No, we're not. So, here's what I had here. I have a saying that I want to share with you, okay? And the saying goes like this. Being bitter, you know what being bitter is? being upset with other people and holding a grudge and being mad at them. Being bitter is like eating poison and hoping that it affects the other person. If you Think about that for a second. If you're upset about what somebody else does and you're all mad about it and you're all about it, do you think that it bothers the other person at all that you're mad? Probably not. But do you know who it does bother? It bothers us. So I was thinking to myself, I don't want you guys to eat poison, but maybe if you had some of Dave's Insanity hot sauce and then thought, I'm going to eat some hot sauce and hope the other person feels it in their mouth. Do you think that would work? No, it doesn't make any sense at all, does it? No. So instead of being upset with what other people do, instead of being mad that they did something that you didn't like, Instead of holding a grudge or being bitter, 
what we try to do is offer forgiveness, right? Yeah, I think that needs to be down. <laughs> you silly girl. Okay, so What's the treat? treat this hot sauce. No, you can have some if you want, Grayson. No, I'm not going to let you have any of that. It's terrible. Okay. So, so let's pray, okay? Where are you going to put it? Up there? Okay, afterwards. Let's pray first. Okay. Dear Lord, we don't want to hold on to bitterness because that's like eating insanity hot sauce and hoping other people feel it in their mouths. It doesn't make any sense. Help us to be forgiving instead and let other people have the grace from us that we get from you. You love us and help us to love them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. over the hot sauce it has a lid <laughs> burn even the skin right off <laughs> oh boy <laughs> okay let's stand and sing change my heart oh god this is how to get the bitterness out of our lives it's for jesus god to change our hearts change my heart
right. You bet. You may be seated. Peggy, thank you for reminding us of where we've been in this series. It's important for us to keep our eye on that. I don't want us to go from one to the other to the other without recognizing how they all tie together. So that was very appropriate there. We've been talking about purpose, what our purpose is as the church. And before we begin today, before we read our scripture, I want you to think of that person that you're mad at. Think of that person that you would like to feel Dave's insanity hot sauce. Think of that person that still plagues your heart with some bitterness, a little resentment perhaps, a desire for what you might consider justice. Think about that person today. If you're interested, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. It's a short passage, so you don't need to, if you don't get there in time, that's okay. But in Matthew 18, we've got this passage where Jesus talks a little bit about what it means to be in harmony with each other in the body of Christ. He outlines a procedure in which we can go through to try to restore relationships. It's great. It's fantastic. We should be following at any time that we have an issue, but as Peter normally does, <laughs> he has to ask for some clarification, a little qualification. So in verse 21 of that 18th chapter, this is what Matthew records. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, well, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. There's a new cat at our house. The latest batch of kittens from the barn cats that wander around our place. They had one that seemed like it needed a little help. Like it was uh, maybe not quite up to the challenge of outdoor life. Tasha's smiling. Tasha's the soft-hearted one, so she adopted him. So we've all adopted him. Um, his name's Buddy. Um, I call him Buddy Squints because his eyes are very small. But uh, at any rate, Buddy, he's at that stage of life when he's kind of getting into trouble. I got a great big scratch here that's just healing up. Buddy gave me that. This one's from earlier today, so that one's... That one's going. So uh, in the middle of the night, he wants to sleep right next to you on the bed. So that turns the internal thermostat up to about a bajillion degrees. And he won't move. You try to push him, and he just kind of flops over, rolls right back into the same hole. If you try to shut him out of the room, he just claws and claws and claws at the carpet. I don't know if you have a cat that does this. You know they don't really want to be with you when they do that. They just want you to open the door. Just do what I want you to do. We want you to, I, want, I want to be in there. The closed door is an insult to him. You can't put toilet paper on the roll, you know, on the holder, because he does that and shreds it all to pieces. Whole entire rolls of toilet paper, gone. He's a little hard to live with right now. This morning we're going to talk about this idea of forgiveness and about how it is essential in the Christian community known as the church and how it is critical to us being able to fulfill our purpose, the purpose that God has for us. We have to forgive. The passage that Jim read, what we've seen here, Jesus teaches us that conclusion of that prayer. Did you notice he has a wonderful prayer and it's got a lot of points in it and the one point he feels like he needs to clarify is that forgiveness piece. Let me make sure you're clear on that, he says. Forgiveness is important. It's a big deal to think about the fact that maybe God's forgiveness of us, it might be restricted. It might be contingent on our own capacity and willingness to forgive. But you know, I don't really need to forgive our adolescent cat, Buddy. Yeah, he's a punk. He's pain. He's got a long list of crimes that he's perpetrated. But he doesn't need my forgiveness. 
because he's not really offending. He's not blameworthy. He's just a cat. He's doing what cats do. You see, this is where we get into the complexity of forgiveness. The literature is extensive. There are hundreds and hundreds of books that are written on forgiveness. There's countless articles and reflections. There's probably as many sermons have been preached on it. We're Think about it. We think about it a lot. We talk about it a lot. Jim shared an anecdote where he's dealing with it as well. It's, it, it, but we're not always super good at it. We struggle sometimes. And I know I'm just adding to the pile of sermons already preached on it. Um, probably not tilling any new soil for you. But we do need to think about it. We do need to talk about it. We do need to consider it. And, and most importantly, we actually have to do it. We need to make forgiveness a part of our lives. It needs to be our standing, standard operating procedure as Christians if we are going to take the words of Jesus seriously. And not just because Jesus told us to do it, but because we need it. Again, as Jim alluded to, it does something for us. Our spiritual wholeness depends to a degree on our capacity to keep no record of wrongs. Now, in all of our interactions with each other, all of these countless bumping up against each other, we have an impact on others. That's simple to understand. It's just, you know, common sense. That old Simon and Garfunkel song is, was right. No one is an island. We all have relationships. And as much as we want to be independent and live independently of others, we're still caught up in all of these mutually interdependent relationships. We impact each other. Now, it probably starts off with that foundational community, the family. That's where we learn about these things. We interact. We impact our siblings, our parents, our extended family, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, our in-laws. There might be one there. I encourage you all to think about somebody. I don't know, maybe. We impact our communities, we impact our schoolmates, our neighbors, our co-workers, the other drivers on the road. Not literally. I hope you're not impacting them literally. They have an influence on us, though. They have an impact on us. Uh, impactful interactions, they're the fabric of the web that we are all a part of. So it's a truth that we impact each other, that our actions and our words affect other people, as theirs do us. So what? Why is that important? What does it have to do with forgiveness? Well, here's the connection. Like I mentioned earlier, Buddy, Buddy Cat's actions impact me. I have to heal from many of his interactions. But in order for me to need to forgive him, I would have to see those actions as blameworthy. I would have to view the clawing and the biting and the destruction as a moral wrong an offense. I would have to put a value on it, but I don't because he's a cat and a relatively simple cat as cats go. His actions, they don't have a moral component to them because he doesn't make moral decisions. Non-human creatures don't operate on the same ethical wavelength the length as we do as humans. We're unique in that. We are unique in that we are moral creatures. That, that fruit from the tree in the Garden of Eden has had its effect on us. We do know good and evil. So Buddy is not blameworthy because he doesn't act in terms of good and evil. He just is a cat. He doesn't need my forgiveness, just some tolerance and some cat food. That's pretty much all he really needs in life. Now, we're not cats. We're moral creatures, and since we are moral creatures, knowing good and evil, and our actions are what they are, we're not as free from blame as Buddy is. We can't just chalk up the things that we do that are immoral to human nature. Well, that's just the way I am, the way we could if we did it for a cat. So as moral creatures, we can be blameworthy when we do something that's wrong. We can cause offense. We can harm other people with malice. We can wound and kill and destroy out of selfish motives. Now, we have just as much ability to do what is right, but it's the bad stuff that we do, the blameworthy stuff that makes forgiveness so important, such an essential part of what it takes to have harmony and functionality 
in the body of Christ. And so we need to keep an eye on that. It's an important one. Our first true thing here that we've talked about is that we do have an impact on each other. Okay? We're not isolated. We're not independent. We're connected with each other. The second true thing is this. Our impact, those actions that we do that affect other people, our impact can be negative. It can, have, it can be bad. It can impact them in a, in a harmful way. And third, as moral creatures who know right from wrong and who know good from evil, we have responsibility for those things that we do. We can be worthy of blame, and rightfully so. We're not cats just doing what cats do. So we can cause offense. We can harm others. We are responsible for that negative impact. We are rightfully blameworthy. It can happen. It does happen all the time. Paul talks about it in Romans 7, 19. For the good that I, for for I do not do the good that I want to do, But the evil I don't want to do, this is what I keep doing. It happens. The evil nature impacts the people that surround us. So how do we solve it? How do we navigate it? How do we get through it? How do we we work through this problem that we keep doing the evil that we don't want to do, impacting each other in negative ways? Well, on the one side of it, okay, the side of the offender we ought to stop doing that stuff. <laughs> stop doing the bad stuff. Stop being selfish. Stop being angry. Stop acting from that darker side of our nature. We need a changed heart. Another good song, Peggy. Thank you for that. We need that changed heart. Paul talks about this in the next chapter, chapter 8 in Romans. Says, Since Jesus has set you free from this evil nature, stop living as if it were still part of who you are. Stop offending So from that side of things, the side of the offender, just don't do it anymore, okay? That's your sermon. You can go home now. No. (laughs) I know know we're going to struggle with that. I do. We can't bank on that when it comes to having the harmonious and life-giving relationships, even in a place that should most fully show those, most fully manifest that harmony, the church. Even in the church, maybe particularly in the church, We still are trying to escape this wretched state that Paul describes in which we know what we should do, but we don't do it. Even though Christ has set us free, we still do things of which we are blameworthy. So if we were able to, 100% of the time, do always the right thing and do all the good and none of the evil, we wouldn't need forgiveness. A principle of forgiveness would not even really have to factor in. But since God knows us better than we know ourselves, God's given us a way to navigate the redeemed but still imperfect relationships that we all have, and it's forgiveness. So, for now, let's set aside that universal call, that universal need to do the right thing, do that, but let's just not watch that for right now. We know we need that, but we'll set the truth aside for the moment. Let's look at this whole thing from the standpoint of the offended party. The one who has been impacted. Okay? Our scripture for today, that two verses there in the 18th chapter of Matthew, that exchange between Peter and Jesus. That scripture has the disciple asking Jesus about the limits of forgiveness. How far should it go? How far should it go? Now keep in mind, like I said, Jesus has just outlined a whole process of reconciliation. How you work this stuff out. How you deal with being sinned against. Okay, he's just told us what to do when we're offended, when the other is blameworthy, and we want to fix that relationship. But Peter, being Peter, wants to quantify it and clarify it and try to give himself a little bit of wiggle room here. Okay, he wants to know if there's a limit to what Jesus is talking about. So unpack this, what, Jesus, what Peter is asking here. The traditional way that human beings look at these sorts of relational exchanges, the, the, the traditional way that we understand offense is retaliation. You disagree with me, watch siblings together. 
That's the way we're wired. Somebody offends, somebody is blameworthy, and we want to get them back. We want to repay them the evil that they've given us. That, you know the old eye for an eye that we've all heard about, that rule? That was actually a way to check excessiveness in retaliation. The even older human rule was don't just go after the eye, go after the whole thing. All right, you, you take my eye, you're dead. I'm going to kill you. That's how far it used to go. Now, you watch kids, particularly in the backseat of the car, on a long trip. Okay, I don't know. Our car had uh, uh, stripes in the seats, and we, we cut up all the real estate based on those stripes in the seats. And if you crossed over the line, boy, so help me. So kids do this. Uh, it's like the escalation of retaliation. She poked me, and so I hit her. Come on. <laughs> this is what kids do, right? That old eye for an eye, well, that's a limit. You can't, you can't escalate this. You have to restrict your retaliation. You can only respond in kind. You can't do more. But it's still retaliation. Like I said, most kids, a lot of kids, operate in this way until they learn otherwise. That's our job as parents. We teach them it's inappropriate to hit your sister when she pokes you. Right? You shouldn't do that. And then we go a little further. We say, you know what? It's inappropriate to hit your sister at all. We don't solve things by hitting people. We tell them that. Don't do it. But what happens is that then we take that, that uh, feeling and we just push it down inside. We sublimate it. We, 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 we press it down into the core of our heart because it's still not fair. It's still not just. They shouldn't get away with the offense. They're worthy of blame. And since I can't punch them like I want to or retaliate in any socially unacceptable way, I end up just festering inside with that resentment. The bitterness and the resentment, it just takes the place of physical violence. It's the same heart. It's the same attitude. That old eye for an eye, it's just trying to squeeze out a different hole here. The offender is worthy of blame, and I'm going to blame him. I'm going to carry that until justice is served. And what ends up happening isn't a solution, isn't a resolution. It's a multiplication of wrong. Things just get worse. We were wronged, and by not forgiving, by keeping a record of wrong, we compound it. Now, they're suffering because they did something wrong, and we're suffering because we're holding a grudge. Resentment doesn't cancel it out at all. In fact, it, it multiplies it. See, Peter's not trying to find a new way here. He's not trying to figure out how to, how to absorb what Jesus is telling him to do. He wants to still inhabit that old mindset, that old traditional way of understanding. Yeah, I'm going to push it out a little ways. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to forgive seven times, but at the end of that seven times, all bets are off. I want you to think about a scenario here. Say Peter is thinking about somebody in particular. He's got somebody in mind when he asks this question. Let's say it's his brother Andrew, you know, because siblings. You know how they are. Andrew, he is a complete slob. Every time we bunk together, he leaves his stinky sandals all over the place. He's always borrowing my cloak without asking, and he brings it back dirty. I don't know. He's just, he's just the worst. And Peter knows it's not right to punch Andrew in the nose. He knows that. And even though he feels like doing it once in a while. And Peter knows what Jesus has said about forgiveness. It's right there in that prayer that Jesus taught him earlier. So Peter feels like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good here if I don't limit my forgiveness to just one time. I'm, I'm pretty hot stuff if I can forgive that slob Andrew seven times. Right? Yeah. But by limiting it in any way, to any kind of number, what is Peter doing? He's reserving blame. He's holding that back until he gets to that seventh time. Then he can play it. Then he can bring it out, even though he's supposed to be releasing him, forgiving him. You see, if forgiveness is what we hope it to be, what we pray it to be, a, a total release from blame, offered to the blameworthy person, why should there be any reservation? 
That's what Jesus is getting at. Not seven times. Keep going. Wouldn't that diminish forgiveness to reserve any blame? Wouldn't it reduce forgiveness into something conditional and weak? I know forgiveness is complex. I know these people that I invited you to think about at the beginning of the, of the, serve, the message today, I know you're like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to work that out. I, I thank you for that example. I was like, man, how, how, how do I do this? Oh. In Luke chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus himself connects forgiveness and repentance, making the repentance of the offender a significant part of the whole process. So in this supposed scenario that we've imagined between Peter and Andrew, we haven't even really considered whether Andrew is at all repentant. It's not part of the text that we're looking at. So I get it. It is complex. There's an inevitable give and take here when we want to achieve some kind of truly reconciling, healing kind of forgiveness. But if we wait till that point, if we wait till we've got that repentance, that reconciling repentance, it's important, don't get me wrong, but if we wait till then, we're still missing out on what Jesus actually tells us to do. We're still clinging to that idea that they are blameworthy in some way, still viewing their offense as something that we're going to carry with us until it is straightened out. Well, they are blameworthy. We're not pretending that they're not, but are we wanting to continue to hold that over them? Or do we want to set it aside and offer forgiveness? What I think that Jesus is talking, what I believe that Jesus is talking about here isn't the act of forgiveness. It's the attitude of forgiveness. Now, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you know that Jesus reframed many of the commandments, taking them out of the action and putting them right squarely into a matter of the heart. You know, it's that, that example of that heart hatred you have for your brother being the same as murder. You know, that, 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 that looking lustfully at somebody is the same as committing adultery. Jesus lodges these things right squarely in the heart. It's an attitude, it's, a, it's a, a, a condition of the heart, and I think it applies to forgiveness. What matters is what's going on in here. Somebody offends, which they will, it just, it's going to happen. A sister or a brother in the church, in this, to be specific here. What is our response? Is it a, a, a pantomime of forgiveness? <laughs> you know, is it play acting? Is it the words, ah, I forgive you, even, even repeated seven times? That's not the same as a heart that doesn't hang on to that blameworthiness of the offender, that fixation that manifests itself in the, the bitterness and the resentment and the complaining. Forgiveness itself, it may not bring about a full reconciliation. Repentance. That's an important part of this. It's, it's necessary on the part of the offender for that true reconciliation to happen. But a true heart-deep forgiveness begins to heal us. Like Jim was saying in this example that he gave us earlier, it heals the one that has been offended, which is so important. It clears out that festering anger, that, that cancer of bitterness that, that, that looks an awful lot like repaying evil for evil which is what we're commanded not to do. So far, we in this series, we've been talking about these elements of our purpose, what our purpose is as the church. And we started out with the foundational things that the community of faith needs to embrace in order to really embody what God has for us, what God wants us to be, and what God wants us to do. We need to teach each other. That was the first one that we started with. It's uh, we need to learn what the scriptures tell us and, and, and share that with each other so that we can more fully live it out, be that faithful follower of Jesus. And we need to care for each other. And again, I'm appreciative that you sang that song today to remind us that, yeah, this mutuality, this sharing in, of each other's joys and concerns and burdens and, 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 and all of it, living life together is a really important part. In that selfish, self-serving world out there, our testimony about Jesus is the most clear when we are sharing with each other, when we're concerned with the well-being of our sisters and brothers as much as we are our own. And in the church, 
this is the third foundational thing. In order for us to really be who God wants us to be, to actually do what God wants us to do, is to show the world what grace looks like. Because that is what forgiveness is. It is grace made visible. We've got to go back to these verses that we've looked at already, where we've seen in the past... Well, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5. We, we looked at that verse or chapter already that God does not count our trespasses against us, but instead wants to reconcile us to himself through the blood of Jesus. Wow. God does not count our trespasses against us. And then a little in Romans 5, Paul reminds us there that God proved his love for us in that we, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Let that sink in for a minute. He goes on, for if while we were enemies of God, he says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. You see that? You see what God does? You see what's going on? The character of God? Do you see it? It's the very definition of grace. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve that. We're trespassers, we're sinners, we're enemies of God. We are absolutely and completely blame-worthy. We are worth the blame. And God knows that. God knows that perfectly. God's justice demands a full accounting of our offenses, but God's grace manifests in his forgiveness that allows God to set aside our blame-worthiness and accept us and love us in spite of that offense. This is what God does through Jesus Christ. Can I get a hallelujah about that? Oh. See, God doesn't pretend that our sin doesn't matter. God doesn't say, eh, no big deal. It is a big deal. Not to pretend that the other is perfect or to pretend that there was no offense. God instead wants us to forgive each other. Acknowledge, but forgive. God knows that we are blameworthy, but treats us as blameless. And God wants us to treat each other as he has treated us. So, I'm going to give you something definitive this morning. We, as the church, are explicitly called to copy this part of God's character. Did you catch that when Jim read it this morning? Those last few verses just after the Lord's Prayer? We are explicitly called to copy this part of God's character. To forgive as we are forgiven. And again, a body with Christ as its head needs to be obedient to that head. You see, we collapse into dysfunction and, and irrelevancy when we don't do what Jesus explicitly tells us to do. We, we can't even call ourselves a church if we do that. So to be faithful witnesses of God's grace, we need to extend that grace. We need to share that grace. We need to give that godly grace to each other. But where that grace comes from, where that grace flows from, it needs to come from a heart of forgiveness. That's the changed heart, the transformed heart, if you want to pull a whole other scriptural principle into this. When we limit forgiveness, when we restrict forgiveness, we're still harboring at the very foundational level that, that eye for an eye kind of resentment. Forgiveness is fine as far as it goes, but I'm not really going to be satisfied until I get my retribution, until I have my vengeance. Uh, those are strong words, but isn't that what we're after when we are resentful? constantly revisiting past wrongs. What does Paul say about love? Keeps no record of wrong. But we do. Constantly revisiting these past wrongs, allowing our resentment or our bitterness to, to shape our interactions. Mm, well, I don't know if I want to talk to you because of what you did that last time. Nursing a grudge. These are all signs that underneath whatever superficial forgiveness that we might offer each other, even a seven times repeated forgiveness, there's a heart of retaliation that's clouding up the grace that God wants us to give and that God has given to us. And so 
here's the explicit thing. Here's the, 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 the sure thing, the thing that you can take to the bank. Jesus wants us to forgive. And Jesus doesn't say, forgive them, you know, if they meet certain criteria. He just says forgive. Jesus wants us to forgive, and we need to do it. Not just because Jesus says to do it, although that should be enough. But we need to do it because Jesus knows that in a world of blameworthy offense, keeping a record of that offense only makes the problem worse. We're going to find that it is much easier to be who God wants us to be, to proclaim that gospel of love and forgiveness if we practice those things ourselves. So who were you thinking of at the beginning of the the message today? Do you need to talk to them? Maybe. Do you need to forgive them? Yes. Let's pray. Gracious God, God of forgiveness, you have looked upon us and you have seen how broken we are. You have seen that evil nature, the one that we choose over and over and over again, manifests in our interactions and the relationships that we have with each other. We are not always nice. And not only were we not nice to each other, but we were enemies of you. We chose to be your adversaries, to be sinners, to be transgressors. And yet you did not look at that. You looked at us with love. And you forgave us. Your forgiveness extended to us before we asked for it, before we reached out for it, before we even knew we needed it. You did this for us. And Lord, while we know that reconciliation and and healed and restored relationships take work and they take repentance and they take an acknowledgement of the wrong and the offense, we know that they have to start with a willingness to forgive. As you have forgiven us, Lord, help us to forgive each other. To reach out with that same love and grace that you gave to us so freely. Help us to know what it is like to be like you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song. As we know, we our desire for forgiveness has to come from within us, within Jesus, changing our heart to where we want to do that. And the closer we lean on Him, the more He will work in our hearts that we can forgive. I don't think it's really something that you can just do on your own.
It is complicated, forgiveness. It's not easy. And I know that uh, a, a sermon like that only can hit the high points. If you're interested in talking more about it, if you have questions, I'm more than willing to enter into that conversation with you at some point. But uh, do know that we are called to it. If you would bow with me for our closing prayer. Lord, we do need to lean on you. We need to receive from you the power that we need to live the way that we need to live. It is from you that we get the capacity to forgive, and so we ask for that. We ask that you would bless these, your children, your people. Keep them safe in all that they do. Help them to share your love with others in the world, to draw them closer to you. And bring us together again so that we can worship and praise you. We pray for those that can't be here today. We ask a special blessing on them. Keep them in the palm of your hand. Help them to feel your presence as they go about their, their day and whatever it is that they have in front of them. We thank you. Thank you that you love us. Help us to love each other. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.